So last week, if I'm not mistaken, I covered the rapture. I, I covered a few things. I covered the rapture, covered the resurrection. Um, to Fred's point, I was teaching the, the pre-tribulation rapture. There are other viewpoints. At the end of the day, I respect all Christians. As long as we have the fundamentals down, hey, at the end of the day, we're going to be in heaven. Whether it was at this time, that time, or that time, at the end of the day, we can be in agreement of, of you know, what we're looking forward to. Um, we did look at the the resurrection, the changing of the body, the 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 actual changing. It doesn't say that we get a different body, but that our current body transforms scientifically, biologically speaking. I don't know exactly what that entails, whether God is using the same atoms or, or, or changing something. You know, we don't fully know all those uh, intricate details. We'll find out and we'll ask him, you know, if we care that much um, when, when, when we're up there in heaven. Um, one of the interesting things I pointed out, which is something that, again, we'll see later on in the future, is in respects to the rapture, just looking at the book of Revelation. So a lot of times, you know, people are, are, are well known for going to First Thessalonians chapter four and, and different certain key Bible verses like First Corinthians chapter 15. But just from looking at the book of Revelation, there appears to be a handful of different types of rapture. And it's interesting to list those out. I, I was listing them out last week where you saw in Revelation chapter four, John got called up by the sound of a trumpet. To, um, and he went up to heaven. Um, you see the same with the tribulation saints, uh, the, the Gentile saints, the Jewish saints. And at the same time, even one that I didn't mention that I was thinking about the other day was in Revelation 11. You technically also see another type of rapture per se with the two witnesses after they died. Then again, a voice called out to them, come up. What's interesting about that one is that all the people saw them go up. It wasn't a disappearing per se. It was that they saw them go up. Um, but still, th you can technically categorize that as, as another rapture. Um, and, and I mentioned that because nine out of ten times, I feel like the people that are very confused with, with what's going on in the book of Revelation haven't detailed and separated those things of, of what is happening here, what group is this, what group is that, and separating those things helps clarify the image of what's going on. Aside from that, we covered some of the most important topics in respects to our life, our mission as a Christian, which would be um, how we're serving God. Um, ultimately, what are we building with? Are we building with imperishable items or perishable items? That comes down to what we do in our daily lives as Christians or, or, or just in, in a ministry sense. Um, and even if you have a full time job, I, I don't think it uh, takes you out of the equation of being able to build on imperishable things. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Yes, a reward is a crown, but that we that shouldn't be the only reason why we do it. At the end of the day, the, the, the glory of the crown is that we're able to bow down and give it to God um, and, and give it to Christ because he's the one who ultimately deserves it. So on that note, we continue. And one of the concepts that, that again, speaking on behalf, I, I don't want to jump around from pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. I will continue uh, with, with what I lean heavily the most, which is a pre-tribulation view. Um, and with that being said, we, I believe that there is a seven-year period of time that we will be up in heaven and that this coincides with the wedding feast of the Lamb. Now, let, let's speak a little bit about the wedding feast of the Lamb. So these are a few, uh, I guess, analogies uh, that, that the New Testament uses in relation to the church. And one of the things I want to point out is that you do not, you never see these types of titles in relation to Israel. Um, so let me first go to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 through 33. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife 
as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. So drawing on the analogy, the fact that we get married is, is an illustration to how Jesus is, quote unquote, married to us, how we are one, um, how, how we may be separate, but he is the head of the house and, and how we follow in his footsteps. Even as males, we are called the bride of Christ uh, collectively being part of the church. Uh, another verse I want to look at is Second Corinthians chapter 11. Verse two, which says. For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. Again, the idea that that. Um, we're a pure bride to Christ. Jesus is the bridegroom. Again, going to uh, Ephesians chapter five, verse twenty three. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body and the church. Again, continuing that analogy, we have a, re a wedding to get ready for. Um, I'll just read this one. Uh, Ephesians chapter five, verse 25 and 27 for husbands. This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. So not only did Christ cleanse us, he calls us to also remain spotless, remain holy, continue that lifestyle. And we've we've already previously looked at the story of how we were not originally invited to the wedding, how uh it was originally for the Israelites to join in. They denied Christ. And so in the parable, in the story that, that Jesus gives, that then he tells his servants, well, just go ahead and invite everyone in the street. And where those that came from the street, essentially, um, and, and, and how we didn't deserve to be called clean. Yet God made us clean. And I think that's true, obviously, to this day. Um, we, we don't deserve any of this. Now, all of this ties back to a larger uh, type. We need to stop thinking about a, a Christian, quote unquote, Christian marriage or how we think of a, a, a I guess, an American marriage um, and think of a traditional Jewish wedding. Because there's a lot of uh, parallels to what Christ is doing and what the and what the church is when you pay attention to that type of wedding. So first off. In a traditional Jewish wedding, you won't see this obviously nowadays, but in a traditional Jewish wedding, there was first a marriage contract. The marriage contract was between the the groom, the one who wanted to uh, marry the, the woman and the father of that bride. They had an agreement. It was a payment. Let's say if they came from a very wealthy family or the, the girl was extremely beautiful beyond belief or whatever it is. It was, yeah, hundreds of, of sheep and this many cows and this many pounds of gold and this and that. And, you know, if you came from, you know, a roughly poor family, you know, it was maybe, you know, a handful of sheep or whatever, you know, that 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 group could could afford. Um, obviously, a queen is going to be um, hundreds of thousands of times worth more um, because of what could they afford. But the fact that there is a marriage contract. Also, then the groom leaves to prepare a home for his bride to be. So the, the contract is made. The payment is given. They're still not married yet. Now the groom disappears. I'll, I'll marry you. But first, let me let me first uh, build a house, get all that ready, get all the things that we need to live our life ready. And then we can go ahead and have the wedding and, and go ahead and get married. Um, if you think about when Mary... Virgin Mary, to put it that way, uh, when she got pregnant. They were still not officially married, yet they were betrothed. The contract, per se, was set. Um, but but they but Joseph was still away. Jo Joseph was not there at the moment. That's why uh, Joseph thought, oh, she might have cheated on me or, or whatever it is, because he was out preparing the home to be for both of them. Eventually, the groom returns and ex and escorts the bride. <laughs> And the groom serves a feast 
And the feast typically lasts seven days. Now, we saw a glimpse of, of a feast in John chapter 2 when Jesus turned water into wine. Um, but traditionally, and this is, again, remember types. Remember what I told you in probably the second class we ever had? Types is a form of prophecy. It's an indirect form of prophecy. These patterns, they continually speak over and over. Now, these traditional Jewish wedding feasts lasted seven days. You see evidence of this in Genesis chapter 29, verse 27, and also Judges chapter 14, verse 17, where these wedding feasts lasted seven days. Now, let me ta tie all this back. So there's a marriage contract. The agreement between the father and the groom, Christ and God, and the payment to be made was his own blood in order to purchase us, the most precious of payments, God's one and only son. For Christ said, I am going to prepare a home for you. He was using wedding language per se and you will be with me where I am and I will come and get you following this this analogy that he will also come and get us he is preparing per se a home for us in heaven where we will be with him forever when he comes back he escorts us and then the idea is that there is a feast once once that that joining happens there is a feast I don't believe it's going to last seven days. I think it's going to last seven years because that would coincide with the seven year tribulation. Now, of course, you know, that, that's why I said, you know, I don't want to debate right now between uh, mid post because then, oh, well, you have a three and a half year wedding feast or you have a if it's post, then, yeah, you would literally have a seven day wedding feast. And that, you know, that doesn't sound too extravagant compared to what they were already doing. Uh, but uh, enough of that. So. That's um, that's where that concept is taken from. So understanding that you get to see again the type, the indirect form of prophecy given from that Jewish wedding. Now. During last week and this week, we've spoken a lot about what's been happening in heaven. When when I showed you the timeline, it was uh, about the rapture, the, the award ceremony, that wedding feast. Now, while we're up in heaven, thinking of that timeline. What's going on on earth? And I remember Sheila had had, yeah, had had hit the nail on the head a few weeks back when um, she more or less uh, stated, you probably don't even remember what I'm talking about. What the speculation may be, if a rapture happens and millions, hundreds of millions probably disappear, if not, I don't, I'm not sure how many Christian, real Christians there are in the world, but if not billions of people disappear off the face of the earth, what are those that are left behind going to say what is the most logical per se? Let me put that in quotation marks. Logical uh, uh, statement that can be made of why people have disappeared. Remember, people do not repent. People do not. There may be some that repent, which is why we see those tribulation saints in the book of Revelation, which is why we see a subsect of one hundred and and forty four thousand Jewish people that are sealed by God. That, you know, are, are already know f f off from the bat, from the beginning of, of the book of Revelation that um, that they're already sealed by God and they're, they're not going to fall to the false uh, priest to the Antichrist. So if the world doesn't repent. What argument are they going to say of why people randomly disappeared? Now, of course, it's speculation. I want to put this in the field of speculation. I can't show you a Bible verse per se that, oh, you know, this is going to be it. But my speculation is that people are going to say that, well, UFOs took them. Um, this is something, if, if you recall, a few weeks back when probably like week four, um, speaking of, of, of things of the sons of God, the Nephilim, things like that, and how essentially that's kind of reoccurring. Just looking at forget the forget the conspiracy theories, the fact that governments are talking about this, governments are disclosing this information. So are they being deceived? Unfortunately, a lot of our government officials don't hold the Bible as truth anymore. So if angels, which we believe are real, which, according to the Bible, can appear in the form of a man, come and tell them a lie. They don't have a Bible to back up that that lie to argue against that lie 
So let, let's continue. What lies will be said when millions disappear off the face of the earth? Surely there will be those that claim that they're Christian yet were not raptured, causing confusion to the event. I'm pretty sure there's some televangelists that, you know, only care about money and they're going to be on. It's true. And they're going to be on TV. And well, I'm Christian and I didn't get raptured. I'm, I don't think that's a rapture. There's going to be some Christians like that. You better believe it. <laughs> so I, I regret to inform you, but sometimes some of the worst people I've met happen to call themselves Christian. And that's a sad statement to make. Um, so you better believe that during those seven years, there's going to be some people that lie and say, hey, I'm a Christian and I didn't get raptured. I don't think that's a rapture. I think that's probably maybe UFOs. Um, there may even be believers raptured. Hold on. There may even be believers raptured that kept their faith hidden. Think about situations like China or extreme or extremist Muslims where Maybe you see that people in certain situations like that were raptured. So then on the news, the counter argument is no, but not all Christians got raptured because this person was not a Christian, maybe because they were hiding it for their own sake of life. So it's things like that that might muddy up the waters and it won't be so clear. This is just, you know, me speaking speculation. Um, and as I've mentioned to you before, and I'm just going to kind of blast through this because I did go more in detail a few weeks back. Um, in the past few years, the Department of Defense has come forward with video evidence confirming that UFOs are indeed real. Disclosure is slowly trickling in, but the truth is not found in the government. The truth is not found by conspiracy theorists, by psychics, by channelers, not even by abducted individuals. If you research the conspiracy deep enough, you'll find that they want to produce with mankind. Their kind is quote unquote dying off. Uh, Roswell supposedly and other incidents like this were staged to provide government advanced technologies uh, to and and it was acquired essentially by reverse engineering abductions have been stopped when the abductee called on the name of Jesus a lot of people that that study uh, UFOlogy not recommending that you get deep into it like and I've told you before I, I I equate this to studying demonology it's be careful don't don't um, study it too long but there are several instances where an abductee was stopped. Uh, the, the, the abduction was stopped because they called upon the name of Jesus. The people, the atheists that, that study this topic, they don't have a good reason as to why that happens. Yeah, we know that every name shall bow and obey that name, uh, the name above all names. Top nations Again, uh, speaking conspiracy, uh, top nations are secretly working with these entities. Their desire is to cleanse Mother Earth. And this is probably what a lot of the, the lies that, that come forward during the tribulation, what it's going to be about. A lot of this uh, push for, for, you know, being green and all these things, um, it's going to eventually transform to, and, and pay attention to this, to the love of Mother Earth, to the worship of Gaia, the, the, the Earth. Um, and pay attention to that. It'll slowly turn into that. Uh, and, and that's going to be the purpose. Notion is that we can become like gods. To the to the contactees that, that, you know, get abducted or have these visions and see these entities. I'm just telling you what they say, what, what they're told by them, that you too can become a god. Well, in Genesis, what, chapter three, the serpent deceived Adam and Eve just like that. It's the same lie and it's the same temptation that, that humans continue to fall into. Uh, say it again. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And they accepted that gospel and they accepted that gospel. Um, it, it pleased them to hear that. Um, have <clears throat> This was also interesting. Have appeared in times of war. The original UFOs, when we when we coined the term UFOs, because there are more ancient um, um, accounts um, from from like the second century or, or third century, something like that. But during World War One, if not World War Two, Foo Fighters were the original UFOs before that term UFOs were, was coined before even the term flying saucers. Saucer being a, a plate. There was something I had to learn. Um, not, not like I have a saucer in my house. Um, the original term was Foo Fighters. And one of the things that we may see if war does ensue, if, if you know, World War Three per se begins again, 
we may begin to see these quote unquote fool fighters again. Um, another thing I probably didn't list here is that um, most and and most government officials that you know have have spoken about this, they have stated that UFOs appear to be highly um, interested in nuclear weapons and nuclear technology. So whenever there's a if if it's a submarine and it has nuclear missiles, they happen to be around it, um, and they're they probably want to encourage something like that. Um, during the Cold War, I remember this story. During the Cold War, um, so there's a guy in the United States and a guy in Russia, obviously not friends, <laughs> um, and they both had the power, the authority to be able to nuke the, 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 the country. Obviously, it never happened, thank God. But there happened to be a malfunction whether it was on both sides or just one side, let's let's just say it was the Russian side, that there was some kind of malfunction where it was stating that the United States was nuking Russia. It was a technical malfunction. And he had to make the decision. It was his intuition that told him, no, it has to be some kind of a lie. He was supposed to nuke, nuke back um, in, in that in-between time, yet he... Something something in him was telling him this has to be a malfunction and he could have pressed the button. What he would have thought was a response, a retaliation would have been our eyes actually been a first strike. And then that could have led to a nuclear war back, way back in the 90s during the Cold War. That could have been one of these guys over here messing with that. Something like that may happen. Um, just, you know, ke keeping those possibilities open. Um, again, speaking of biblical accounts, angels can have a very physical impact, a, a very real impact into our world. Uh, continuing, be careful in studying this subject. The matter should be dealt with the same caution as the occult or demonology, knowing to never dive in too deep nor too often. Um, and that's definitely a temptation because you never get the full story. This subject is designed to want to keep you searching, searching, searching. But at the end of the day, you're never going to find anything. And as you continue searching and getting deeper, 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 eventually you're going to look around you and realize that that's what's completely around you because that's what you've been filling your mind with. So again, please be very careful. There are some interesting things that I, I basically put them here. <laughs> you don't have to you don't have to research them. I did that dive and got out. <laughs> so you don't have to do it. Continuing biblical references to angels, um, it refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. Interesting, since a lot of these things happen in the air. They have the ability of appearing as men or even transforming into an angel of light. As it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. The days of Noah, this is, you know, things that we've covered before. The days of Noah had fallen angels who removed their okaterion, their clothing, something that, that we spoke about last week uh, to reproduce with humans. Um, warnings that it will, Jesus warns that it will be like the days of Noah in the future. And he said that in Matthew chapter 24, uh, we also see an odd mention in Daniel chapter two of the, 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 the clay and the iron. And it mentions the clay as something other than the seed of men. Now that's one view. And, and I'll share with you a, a few different views when we actually do study Daniel chapter two. Uh, but that might be a possibility. Uh, these beings gave mankind the new technologies. We're going to Apocrypha now, which is, again, why I'm calling it speculation. But you see that in, in Enoch chapter 7, chapter 8. It mentions that there were more technologies that could have been revealed to mankind. Uh, so we will probably see more when this happens again. You see that in Enoch chapter 16. Um, and as a reminder, in Ephesians chapter six, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the high places. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly, clearly that the last times in the last time, some will turn away from the faith. They will follow the decep deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. The Mormons is a perfect example any anyone that changes that fundamentally changes the, the 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 well the fundamental doctrines of the gospel that is a deceptive spirit a a teaching a doctrine of demons 
will we see new ones, more of them? Or, or like what I was saying, the cleansing of Mother Earth, the worship of, of Mother Earth, of, of Gaia. Is that something that will arise when these things occur? It's possible. Now, hmm. This video is a little long. If you want, I could leave it as as um as just a link on YouTube. Um, this is a pastor from from K House uh, uh, Ministry. What he was doing for 15 minutes, which is why I kind of want to save time and not go through it. But he was reading again demonic stuff per se. Um, he was reading a psychic. Um, like the occult people receiving messages from these star beings telling them what's going to happen in the future. It's a long video, um, but um, I mean, it's 15 minutes. Um, but what's interesting is that there's a lot of parallels to the rapture and the tribulation and what they're saying. Um, and it's it's already Satan trying to deceive and put his frame of the picture of what's going to happen in the end times. And. Or oh, you may hear of wars and, and, and things may change and there may even be people that disappear, millions that disappear one day off the face of the earth. But don't worry, it's all part of the plan. We've just take them, taken them up. This is like I'm paraphrasing some of the quotes. We've just taken them up to, to you know, our, our mothership and um, we're, we're just, I don't know, it speaks in a lot of new age terms like, oh, like we're fixing their frequencies or whatever it is. It doesn't speak in Christian terms, obviously. Um, but don't worry, um, they'll they'll be back or something like that. Um, and and yeah, there there may be troublesome times on the earth, but it's okay. This is all part of the plan. Um, and it seems that and and these prophecies per se were from the eighties. Um, I could just imagine that you know things like this become prevalent again. Well, the fact that it was already recorded from the seventies and the eighties and things like that already speaks to something. Um, so people may be like, Hey, look at this, but this was prophesied and people believe that instead of again, the Bible who unfortunately many have just thrown to the side. It's interesting. It, it's something interesting to see. Um, I'll put it, I'll just put it as a link on YouTube. Let me forward. Um, and just to close off with the wedding feast, there is also an interesting mention in uh, the, the book of Revelation, speaking of the supper of, of the wedding feast of the Lamb. So during the tribulation, there will be people that repent. And this, you know, the, the, this is regardless of, you know, pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. There will be those that repent during the tribulation. Um, speaking on behalf of the pre-tribulation, so I'll just focus on that a little bit more right now. Speaking on behalf of the pre-tribulation, if we if we believe that the rapture happens, the 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 current believers are taken up to to the air to be with Jesus, then that means during that seven year period of the tri of the tribulation, there will be those that repent. You may have, let's say, a brother, uh, an uncle, whatever it is that decides to repent. Hey, what they told me came true. I may see this and that on the news, but whatever it is, or it could be a backslidden Christian that maybe had walked away from God for a few years. This occurs and now they're, they wake up and, oh Lord, now I'm in the midst of this. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> here today. Um, now I'm in the midst of this. So there will be those, it's simple, to, it's easy to see that there will be those during the tribulation that repent. Now, they are not given the same privilege as us. You know, we come through grace, through peace, through faith. They go in technically with a lot less faith per se because of already some of the amazing things that have happened. But what sucks is now the trial that they have to go through is not being killed, is standing up for what they believe. Before, now, right now, we're coming freely to what we believe. But during that time, if you believe that you better be willing to risk your life depending on how how much you believe that so that's part of the trouble part part of the struggle of what those believers have to deal with um another thing we see which we'll cover right now in a second is that there are those let me mute my phone there are those that 
in the fifth seal, chapter six of the book of Revelation, there appears to be souls under the altar. They're dead. They're, they're already dead believers um, that have died for their faith, yet they are told to wait. It appears that they're not with the Lord. It appears that they are, quote unquote, sleeping, per se, or just waiting. Maybe you want to call that purgatory. I don't know. <laughs> um, but but they're, they're, they're waiting. They're not with the Lord yet. Mind you, during those seven years, there's a wedding feast, yet they're saying, wait, don't go to the party just yet. At the same time, I could almost imagine this is... Um, um, I guess a privilege that they, that they don't get to experience the full length of it because, oh, yeah, sure, just kill me in the first month of the tribulation and I'll be up partying in heaven. That could be, you know, part of the reason why they're told to wait. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure, but that, that might be one of the reasons. But let's look at these Bible verses so that you see this concept that I'm telling you about. So during the tribulation, there will be people that repent and turn to Jesus they will not be raptured, but must live out their days on earth during this time. So just because you believe during the tribulation doesn't mean you get raptured. Matter of fact, as I was saying, a lot of them, unfortunately, have to die. These believers will either die as martyrs during the tribulation or live long enough to make it into the millennial kingdom. To those that die there during the tribulation, uh, this is the verse I was telling you about, the fifth seal in the book of Revelation. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, which this might be hinting at the fact of under the altar, kind of like they're hiding, uh, maybe an underground church. I don't know. It, it could be just something I wanted to point out that I found interesting. Um, the souls of those who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony, they shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, Holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Then a white rope was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little while longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus who were martyred, had joined them. So they don't get to be with the Lord. And this is also in contrast to us who die you know, now, uh, before the tribulation, we're up to be with the Lord. If, 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 you know, if I were to die today, I'd be up to be with the Lord. Yet for some reason, these people are told to wait. So that's, you know, something that seems unique to the tribulation. They do sing a different song. Um, I think I read it last week. It is... um. It's not the song of Moses and the Lamb. I'd have to flip back, but there's definitely a song that they sing where, where they're thankful and their song, it, it's the songs that are interesting. Their song is, is, you know, that they were faithful even with what they had to go through, which is, you know, uh, uh, being martyred or the beast or, or refusing the mark of the beast, things of that nature. Their cleanliness, also speaking on the bride. Okay. So they've been made clean. They've been made clean. They are, they are saved, but for some reason they're told to wait a little while longer. Also speaking of the bride, uh, the, the bride uh, uh, analogy, um, we're given white clothes. Okay. They're going to join the wedding. They're given the proper clothes to join the wedding feast, but they're told to wait. And it's like, wait, 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 you're not VIP. <laughs> the VIP was, you know, at, during the rapture. Um, but but you'll you'll see this verse now where hopefully it ties it back in. I think they're waiting is what it says there. When that John saw or saw the man, that work still hadn't been completed. Right? So they were still sleeping a little while longer, but it also says that they're waiting for the rest of their brothers and sisters to come. Correct. So there's just that's still a process in place. During the rest of the of the tribulation yes. where yes. more will die. Yes, more No, they're not suffering. They're not. They're not like in any kind of hell or anything. They're told to rest. Oh, but yeah, but I mean, but the others haven't died yet, so they're waiting for the others to come join. God is waiting mm -hmm. for. Jesus is waiting for those others to, to join. Him. 
to him and took a sat there and saw the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were to be killed, even as they have been, was completed. But there's still what there there there's still more to come. No matter how that and mind you, that's just the beginning of the tribulation. That's Revelation chapter 6. That is only the fifth seal. There's still seven trumpets. There's still seven bowls. All these terrors. Like, you're, you're honestly in kind of the introduction, per se, of, of Revelation. So um, it speaks of, of, yeah, that period of time where there may be those that die early, but there's much more to come, much more to, to occur. But fast forwarding to Revelation chapter 19. Excuse me. You see a unique mention again, uh, speaking of this supper. You don't see that marriage supper anywhere else in the New Testament. Um, so let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Going back to what you were asking, then he said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So this whole time, every single verse that speaks of the wedding feast of the lamb speaks of the wedding feast of the marriage of, of the marriage of the of the of the lamb. But this is the only time speaking of the supper. Similar to the example I was giving last week, they weren't there for the breakfast, they weren't there for the lunch, but they'll be there for the supper. Um, and I feel like that's what it's pointing to. Also, the fact that it's in chapter 19, just a few verses before we come down with Christ. So tying this back to Revelation chapter 6, to that fifth seal, it seems that they're told to wait until this period of time, until this mention right here. And that could be when all those tribulation saints, all those um, um, uh, also the, the, the Jews that had repented and, and, and came. That could be this could be the moment that happens at last gathering, uh, may, maybe seven days before, you know, and at least they get to have that traditional type of wedding where it's at least seven days. I'm not entirely sure how long it is, but it does seem to be an ending point per se. The title Marriage Supper is unique in the New Testament and seems to point to the idea as the final gathering before all the saints along with Christ coming down to earth. This seems to be the perfect time for the tribulation saints to join him to join in with the rest of the church for the final moment of the wedding feast. And then finally coming back down just a few verses later in verse 11 and 16, then we speak of this. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that... Uh, with it, he may strike down the nations and he will rule with an iron rod and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the almighty and on his robe and on his thigh. He had a name written king of kings and Lord of lords. And that's Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. So you see these same individuals that throughout the, the, the book of Revelation have been given white clothes. And of course, speaking of the church that we've been given white clothes, looking back at Ephesians and how we're the bride of Christ, um, we circumvent. You don't see you see the church in chapter two and three, the letters to the seven churches. You see the lampstands on earth in chapter one. You see the lampstands in heaven in chapter four, chapter five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, chapter six, technically chapter six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. No mention of the church. You go now to chapter 19. You begin to see the church again. Something to, to point out on 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 the, the 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 structure of how the book of Revelation was written. Um, so we seem to circumvent all those chapters, all that struggle and everything. 
um, again, speaking of that wedding feast, being up there in heaven and then coming back down and being with uh, being with Christ, but coming back down and now ruling with him. Uh, him, of course, being the, the, the head. Let me we'll close off with this. We'll take a small break and then um, finish off with with an introduction to the book of Revelation. Um, so there are seven Jewish wedding feasts. And these, again, speaking on typological uh, prophecy, prophecy that can be shown in types where it's indirect. But looking at the story and how it repeats, you you can see how um, it's an indirect form of prophecy, per se. Now, there are seven Jewish feasts that all religious Jews observe and reenact every year. Understanding these through our unveiled eyes, per se, they are veiled because they don't see Christ. They, they don't accept him as, as Jesus, as Messiah. So our eyes being unveiled, we can see now a type and prophecy that they reenact every single year. And it's ridiculous when you think about it, of, of when you understand the details of what they're doing in their feasts. And a lot of times they're not realizing. They're just thinking of the historical significance, but they're not looking at the typological prophecy in it. So the first one being the Feast of Passover. The first Feast of Passover was a lamb that was sacrificed by the blood of the lamb put on the door. Death will skip over you. Typologically speaking, Christ is our Passover lamb. That Passover lamb, it couldn't have been any lamb. It needed to be inspected by the Levitical priests and deemed to have not one flaw. Wasn't Christ also given up to the Levitical priests and judged? Judged unfairly, though, but there was no fault in him. So that, that's the uh, and of course, by his blood, we are saved. Um, these first three feasts that I tell you all occur within one week. The next feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, if you see how this is done, they, they go into their house. Any little speck of yeast must be taken out of their house. Yeast has always represented pride because it puffs itself up. The purpose of this feast is to remove that pride. And it calls on all of us, and, and, and more specifically and typologically speaking, uh, the, the Jews to remove that pride. They thought it was one thing of how the Messiah should be, yet Christ came, but they were too prideful. The, the, the Pharisees were too prideful to see what was before them. Miracles were happening right before them, but they never removed the pride from their heart. And so they couldn't see. Continuing, the Feast of First Fruits, celebrating the first fruits that appear in spring, Christ. One thing I want to point out is that the days that these occurred are the days that these occurred. The day of the Feast of Passover is the day that he was judged by those priests. Um, same thing when 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 they didn't remove the pride from their heart, the feast, uh, more importantly, the feast of first fruits. Coincides exactly with the same day that Christ resurrected. Again, him being the first fruit of a resurrection that one day we, too, will also enjoy uh, looking at that typologically speaking, the feast that we are currently in the feast of Pentecost. This is the longest feast. Um, it, it occurs even even though it's celebrated in one day, which is you count like a week after Passover and then 50 days or something, something to that matter. 50 days after Passover. Um, then you have the week of Pentecost, Pentecost meaning 50, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this is the longest feast, as I was saying, um, well, well, the longest gap of time where no other feasts occur for three months. Mind you, this these three occurred within the span of a week. Uh, after this occurs, there's nothing for three months. What's interesting about this feast is that this is the only feast of the seven feasts where they are able to use yeast in their bread, something that was considered Levitically unclean for the purposes that, that I had just told you, it being considered like pride, it being considered like sin. Yet this is the only time that it was acceptable to have something that would be considered Levitically unclean. The church coincides with Pentecost. 
The Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Are we not Levitically unclean? What Levitical rules do we follow? None. Yet we're called clean. We are like the Feast of Pentecost where it is acceptable for us to not be prideful. Don't get me wrong. But we don't have to be Levitically clean, yet we are clean. Yes, we're still called to live holy. Do not get me wrong. Um, sin is, is completely different. But speaking of Levitical laws, we don't have to follow those Levitical laws per se. Moving on. The next feast. So after roughly a three month gap of time, the next feast is then the Feast of Trumpets. Um, most agree that this coincides with the rapture. Right after that, then it is the Day of Atonement, which is, and, and, and I believe, I, I always get confused, it's either this day or, or the, the week in between, both of those, that it is the saddest Sabbath that they have for the entire year, where the whole nation cries and repents because of what they did. I believe it's the Day of Atonement, if I'm not mistaken. That, typologically speaking, coinciding with the end of the tribulation, when they cry, when they mourn, because they will be seeing Christ come down, and then, oh, he's the Messiah. The one that we denied, the one that we didn't accept, the one that we ridiculed his believers, the one that we said no. And, and the fact that they accepted someone else, they still haven't accepted a Messiah yet, but during the tribulation, they will accept someone else. So imagine the, the cry um, uh, that will be let out. They reenact it every year, but one day it will literally be fulfilled where they will cry for what they did. And the final one being the Feast of Booths, where it represents, um, typologically speaking, they, they, well, they build a very um, raggedy, per se, uh, tent outside. It shouldn't have a roof. You're, you should be able to look up. That little tent, it represents our flesh, our body, where it's, you know, it's raggedy. It, it'll one day disappear. It'll one day die. And the reason why there's no roof is so that you remember when that tent disappears, you will go up pointing at eternity. Um, and, and this is essentially what it points to, you know, Christ reigning as king, uh, the millennial kingdom. Uh, but more more closely looking towards eternity, that after all these things, that's that final feast, looking towards eternity. Um, so that's the, 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 the type and prophecy that we see just by going and looking at the feasts. It's interesting to see that they go in order. They go in order with how prophecy is fulfilled. Now, these three occurred. I'm sorry, these four occurred on the same day. Does that mean that the Feast of Trumpets, that the rapture will occur on the Feast of Trumpets? Maybe, maybe not. Jesus did say no one will know the hour nor the day. But it is interesting to see, and I want to point out, that these four occurred on the same day. So, I don't know. Will God do it? Maybe maybe it's a Feast of Trumpets and nobody was expecting I don't know. Um Oh, really? Because it's a two-day thing. It's a, it's a wow. changing of the year. Hmm. And you read into it. I, I don't know enough to explain it all. But there is something there that, that, that you don't know the day. It, it goes know, over two days. If that's the case. So it, it's, kind of, it's very, very interesting. Because I was listening to some allies speak on that. And uh, they're very firm with it. That it's going to be in that time frame. And they know that the Bible does that's interesting that's interesting also so that's a possibility um I, I did not know that so let's say feast of trumpets happens rapture happens again speaking pre-tribulation um but rapture happens then tribulation begins uh tribulation begins seven years later Technically, because there's a gap of time be before the rapture and the tribulation, seven years later, after this feast, 
seven years later, when this feast occurs, it will also coincide with the ending of the tribulation, which is when they repent. So it's definitely a possibility. I, I like that. I mean, no one will know the hour of the day. It could be another day, um, technically. But just looking at the pattern happening here, you know, that might occur. Um, let's, oh, I highly, highly, highly recommend, we'll finish here and then take a short break. Um, highly recommend reading the book Messiah in the Feasts of Israel. This is a Messianic Jew. Um, Messianic Jew being, he's a Jew born and raised and everything, except he came to Christ and I read this book in probably like three days because of how interesting it was. There were so many details, especially with the Passover feast that point to Christ. Even even with the bread that they have in a bag, they have three sizes of breads that are all within one another. Um, and the one that they eat is the one in the middle. And what he points to is that this, you know, coincides with the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. They're all three in one. Yet the one that we're eating, that we're taking a part of, is the middle one, the Christ, the Son. But there's so many things that they reenact every single year. I just covered, you know, the, the general thing of it. But um, a very interesting book by Sam Nadler, um, written in 2010. So, yeah, let's take a break here. And then... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.